Anyone who has ever traced his fingers through Schumann's Kinderzähnen will understand what Plato meant when he once said, music stirs the innermost regions of our soul. What is music that it can move us to such an extent? Is it about something in particular, such as Schumann's Kinderzähnen suggest? We ought to consult the composers themselves for the answer to this question. We know historically that Schumann wrote many poetic musical vignettes, but he affixed titles to them afterwards. And Debussy did very much the same. He put the titles to his 24 preludes in parentheses at the end of each piece. From these examples, and there are many more, we must conclude that composers, unless they set about intentionally to imitate something, speak to us in a language that transcends the material world. It is a language that creates its own universe and abides by its own laws. While no one has ever successfully defined music, we can at least permit ourselves to say of it that it is a language of feeling. And since human feelings have, generally speaking, remained the same from time immemorial, music, therefore, has often been referred to as a universal language as timeless as it is profoundly moving. Now, it is one thing to be moved by music and quite another to express our musical feelings on an instrument. To do this, we need to know two things. One is a knowledge of the instrument and how it produces sound. And the other is a knowledge of the human mechanism. In other words, if a musician is going to express his innermost feelings about music, he has to learn how to make a physical connection to musical feeling. Paradoxically, only then can he divorce himself from the physical and concentrate on the emotional content of music. Now, as pianists, we ought to first explore the piano itself. It is not only our instrument and the instrument through which we can express our deepest feelings about music, but it is also a miracle of human inventiveness. The magnificent piano you see before you is the result of an evolutionary growth that spans almost 300 years. Invented in Florence, Italy by Bartolomeo Cristofori in 1709, the piano differed from all other keyboard instruments in that it was capable of a gradation of sound from piano to forte. This was in contrast to the harpsichord, for example, which was only capable of producing terraced dynamics. In fact, the piano used to be called piano forte, and also forte piano. Subsequently, the abbreviated name piano came into fashion. The piano resembles stringed instruments in several respects. Notice on the violin, for example, that there are stretched strings over a bridge. The bridge is connected to a sound post inside the violin that transmits vibrations from the top to the back. Notice, too, that the back of the violin is convex. 
Getting back to our piano, treble strings are stretched over a bridge that goes almost the entire length of the piano. And tenor and bass strings are stretched over their own bridge. The bridge, in turn, is attached to this soundboard that spans almost the entire dimension of the piano. Like the convex back of the violin, the soundboard has a crown, its thickest point being in the middle, eight millimeters here and five millimeters as it is attached to the rim of the piano. Notice that there are three strings for each treble note, two strings for each tenor note, and one string for each bass note. The strings are held at their proper tension and pitch by means of these pins, and the pins are embedded in six layers of hard maple. Violin strings vibrate when they are bowed or plucked. On the piano, however, strings are activated by hammers rising vertically and striking the strings. Knowing this helps us considerably in our quest for producing beautiful sound on the piano. For instead of merely pushing keys down, our chief concern ought to be lifting hammers toward the strings at an exact rate of speed. The faster the hammer rises, the louder the sound. The slower a hammer rises, the softer the sound. One other thing. When we bang a note by falling on the key far above it with too much speed, the hammer actually displaces the strings, lingers on them for a fraction of a second, with the result that the sound is softer. Nothing is more important to a pianist than the rate of speed at which hammers rise toward the strings. You see, we cannot make quality of sound on the piano the way, for example, string players and wind players can on their instruments. Therefore, with the exception of a skillful use of the right and the left pedals, the only way we can express musical feeling on our instrument is through carefully controlled dynamics and durations of sound. Notice that a depressed key lifts not only a hammer from below the strings, but also a damper above the strings. If we wish to, we can lift all the dampers at once by depressing the right pedal, also called the damper pedal, the sustaining pedal, and sometimes even the loud pedal. When all of the dampers are off of the strings, the piano becomes a potential echo chamber reverberating sympathetically to whatever pitch is sung or called into it. Here is an example. La, la, la. Some contemporary composers call for depressed keys silently with certain dampers being held up and thus strumming the strings. Small reason, then, why the piano has often been called 
a harp lying on its side. Because pianists can sculpt with a skillful use of the right pedal, Anton Rubinstein once referred to it as the soul of the piano. When you engage the left pedal or the soft pedal, the entire action moves over toward the right. Watch it slide. Thus, in the treble, the hammers strike only two of the three strings. In the tenor, the hammers hit one string instead of two. And in the bass, only part of the hammer engages the strings. Interestingly, Beethoven's piano had a lever to the right of the keyboard. When it was engaged, the action moved over farther to the right than does our modern piano. Thus, in the treble, instead of the hammers hitting two strings when the soft pedal was engaged, they now hit only one string. And Beethoven was the first musician to invent the words una corda, which literally mean one string. And those words are used to this very day to designate the engagement of the soft pedal. The important thing to learn about the soft pedal is that it changes the quality of sound on the piano. Thus, the string in the treble, for example, that is not being struck by the hammer vibrates sympathetically without percussion, producing a ravishing sound that no degree of control can reproduce. Join me then and let us shed our guilt concerning the use of the soft pedal and let us call it the other soul of the piano. This is a model of one key of the Steinway action. Believe it or not, the action of the Steinway has 12,000 parts, not to mention the 8,000 other parts in the piano proper. There are two important facts to be learned from depressing a key. One is that when you depress it as far as it will go, you reach the key bed. The other is that the slight resistance you feel when you depress the key approximately halfway down is called the escapement level. Notice that as soon as you pass the escapement level, the hammer drops down slightly below the strings. No matter how much you squeeze or press your finger into the key bed, the hammer continues to lie there unaffected by anything you do to the key. In other words, you have lost all contact with the hammer. As pianists, this fact teaches us to be economical. In other words, pressing, squeezing, coercion of any kind on the keys after we hear the sound is simply a waste of our energy. The most important facts to be derived from a knowledge of the escapement level in the key bed is that it invites us into a magic world of beautiful piano sounds by enabling us to do two things. One is to play accompanying figures softly enough and the other is to voice chords with ultimate control.